Now, what has become interesting to me, whilst I have a lot of people with class one obesity or greater as defined by a BMI of 30 or greater, what I have found is that a lot of those people don't always have massive metabolic derangement. But more often than I think I would, I see near pre-diabetics, pre-diabetes, elevated glucoses, maybe a singular triglyceride level that's out of whack. Glucose homeostasis disruption is seemingly a bigger problem than really cholesterol dysregulation. I think for me, the, the insulin diabetic dysregulation plays as much, if not more of a role and I think it depends on the person. Statins can cause muscle damage sort of independently. And then what happens is if you're an athlete, you're in the gym training and that also causes muscle damage. So welcome back to another episode of the Vitality Code podcast powered by Vitality Telehealth. Whoop, whoop. For all your telehealth <laughs> needs. Um, Throw it in the sound effects for you there, Jason. Boop, boop. I like so it. before we get started, Jason, did you get your Bitcoin in this current dip? Because, I don't know if you checked the price, but we're, we're on our way back up. That's my man. That's my man. <laughs> I, I got my, oh, dude, I'll tell you, this latest dip, you know, you know, producer Nick could weigh in on this. He's, he's oh, it's a He's a little bit of a stock market uh, enthusiast. Is there a term too. for like a, a Bitcoin enthusiast? Is there a is there like a, a coiny yeah, coin head uh, or something? Coin, I don't know. Is there a term? <laughs> a bit I know once you I know once you get a once you get a whole coin, and this was was why I was one my my to do list was you get to be a whole coiner. I'm a now a whole coiner. coiner. Yeah, I gotta, so oh, you got at least man. one. I got to aspire to that. For the precious metals are you know have been have been uh, interesting this year uh, as well as. The rare earth metals, and then you know, uranium has been a huge thing. Stop. Anyway, I, wait, don't get Stop. me, don't get me going, because I'm gonna be. Are you doing rare earth metals too? Are you not? <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> I, mean, I knew it. I knew you were gonna. What say. do you, is, If you like to invest, you definitely need to understand what's happening in energy, green energy, fossil fuels, and uranium and nuclear. And uh, the, if you want to, do you do Substack at all, Jeff? I try to I try to invest purely on emotion and whim. <laughs> what feels right in the moment. <laughs> if I see a headline, I'm buying, baby. Let's go. <laughs> Double down. What's, wait, what's, so what's Bitcoin up to now? Well, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Um, by the time this airs, who knows what it'll be at? It'll be triple exactly, or half. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! It was. Yeah. It was down around fifty-one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was in the fifties. Uh, yeah, it was like it, I think I done as low as fifty one in the last couple of days. I, I might wow. have scooped me up a little bit. I scooped. Yeah, I, I threw the challenge down for you. You you complied. I know. So I, I had to match you. I was like, I can't, <laughs> can't be the only guy in the. I, I went back and I I went back and I did two more of those purchases unbeknownst to you. Oh, you little bastard! The dog, dog yes. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna have to buy some right now then because of that. <laughs> <laughs> that's the ease of it i call it just it's my gambling fix i'm like it's like going to the roulette table for me and since i don't go to the roulette table this is this it satisfies my urge are you really buying it you are aren't you oh, yeah <laughs> i can't let you be the only one all right well on to some serious topics jason um we need to get back to cholesterol cardiovascular risk um we're not going to do statins but what are we going to do? What other medications are out there? What other alternatives? What are some of the newer ones? What's some ways to target ApoB? What are some other new and up and coming uh, heavy hitters? We have Chester back with us um, to bring in the science side as well as some real life experience from uh, some of these prescriptions. So maybe start us off, Jason. What uh, what is the um, do you have any preferreds or any ones that you're using or any up-and-coming ones you want to talk about uh, on the non-statin? As a surgeon and somebody new to this area of medicine, I, don't, I wouldn't consider myself, the, and I'm you know, definitely not a cardiologist, the world's expert on the newest cutting-edge cholesterol. I, I mean, I, yeah. You know, I, it, I, lifestyle management and other impactful things I like to do as well. But I, I think if if it's a triglyceride problem, I'm looking at the glucose homeostasis and maybe even the GLP agonists. And then that's if it's, a great if one. It's, 
Yeah, if it's severe, I'm looking at phenofibrate. I like I, I like the idea of niacin if you can combat the flush the flushing, which I think niaspan has a um, what is it that niaspan has in it? I think it's one of those medications that has something to mitigate the prostaglandin release and thus the flushing. Um, and then when you're talking about PSK9 inhibitors and antibodies to that, and uh, you know manipulating the LDL receptors is what you were doing. That's a little bit out of what I'm used to. And I don't mm-hmm. I have never prescribed a single Before one. Before we go down that PSK, uh, the, the Rapatha train, I'm going to touch base and go off on a tangent. I know our favorite thing to do, but let's talk more about that triglycerides and the GLPs and maybe changing up some of the prescriptions and I don't know, not prescriptions, but maybe um, attack methods that can be indirectly affecting cholesterol. And what are your thoughts on maybe using these GLP ones, not just for weight loss, not just for large doses and can I lose 20 pounds this month? And what about, we talked about this briefly, maybe just using these at a low dose uh, in the background. I don't want to say micro dosing, but maybe smaller dosing to kind of be a longer term adjunct to some of the, to some of the lifestyle medications that people are on. Yeah. I think it's really nice because So with GLPs, there has never really been a medicine in recent memory, actually, that I have I've been able to get behind so much, as, especially as a surgeon, uh, as the GLPs. It's just incredible, incredible medicines. But one of the reasons I like them is because I feel like <clears> – not I feel like – they I, I, I could make the case that they – we talked about in previous episodes to this, the chicken and the egg, inflammation – and uh, cholesterol. I, th- I think you're addressing both things with GLPs. You're, we know there's recent data demonstrating that neurologically mediated neuroinflammation, not as it would be found in brain injury or spine lesions, but uh, you know, uh, inflammation and adipokine signaling from obesity and extra weight on your body, which then predisposes to prediabetes, diabetes, which then propagates worsening obesity and further propagation of adipokine signaling and worsening inflammation in the body can be reversed or certainly mitigated to a large degree with GLP agonists. Specifically, that inflammation from peripheral sources, visceral sources, and for centrally located neurologic sources specifically. Um, it, it, it's fascinating. So you'll see these CRPs come down and other inflammatory markers come down from the use of that Plus, you are improving functioning of lipid metabolism in the liver, especially that which is different. In so, a diabetic is going to have a, a different issue, not or additional issues with dietary fats, postprandial elevation of triglycerides and free fatty acids that non-diabetics don't have. And, and that is a continuum. So people with glucose, with disruption of glucose homeostasis and or prediabetes, and then frankly, and then frank diabetes have the same thing to larger and lesser degrees, depending on where they are on the continuum. GLP agonists address all of those. Yeah. Um, and so instead of having somebody on phenofibrate statins, if you've got them on exercise regimen, testosterone, improving their lean body mass and maybe a GLP, I think you're going to address all those with the only real medication medication being GLP. So I, I see a future in working with a lot of medical weight loss and GLPs and people coming off those medications where you're starting. And I see this in the literature too, if not the frank peer reviewed literature, maybe the peripheral literature around, you know, or the pseudoscience, you know, people just discussing it rather, you know, um, where people are looking at GLP agonists as monotherapy for a lot of things. They're, so people are losing weight. They're coming off their hyper antihypertensives. Their, their lipid metabolism changes, so they're getting off statins or other adjunctive medications. It's, it's incredible. So when you ask me that, that's kind of what, where, I, where I think. And I think I've, we're headed – it's not clear to find, but we're headed there to where I see these as monotherapy. Yeah, I, I think also I've been starting to use them a little bit more in conjunction with maybe some testosterone dosing, some low-dose GLP, not always running that four-week cycle going up 
four week cycle going up, four week cycle going up. Are you having side effects? Are you tolerating this? Are we getting the weight loss that you want? But reframing that as maybe like we're going to optimize your testosterone. We're going to add a GLP one at a low dose to improve your inflammation, to improve your metabolic health, to improve your fat, uh, your body weight over the next year. Um, because I also explain that when I'm talking about my testosterone, I don't look at the testosterone dosing as something we're going to do for six weeks or, or, or three months. And so I'm starting to reframe that a little bit with my, with my GLP ones as well. Um, yeah. And so, uh, so just, oh, I was sorry, I was looking at this article that I was reading, uh, prior to this podcast. It's very interesting that there's this discordance between ApoB levels and LDL reduction of statins. So <clears throat> statins are first line a agents, obviously for lipid lowering. They bring about significantly greater decreases in LDL than ApoB levels. So this suggestion is that are we targeting the right thing or are we not measuring the right thing? I, I don't know just yet, but um, people with, especially people with low LDL or median below the median level of LDL may still have high atherogen, atherogenic risks because of other factors other than LDL, IDLs, VLDLs, triglycerides, etc. Mm -hmm. ApoB lets you calculate that in a more standard unifi uniform fashion. Okay. Um, as well, let me just quote from this article. This feature is of great significance, especially in diabetic patients where atherogenicity has a higher level of dependence on lipoproteins other than LDL, such as triglycerides. And that's where I see GLPs really playing a role. Now, what has it become interesting to me is that I certainly have a selection bias in the clinic. People that are coming for medical weight loss presumably – have weight to lose. Although, whilst I have a lot of people with class one obesity or greater, as defined by a BMI of 30 or greater, and I know BMI isn't everything because you can have a lot of muscle on your body, etc. But that being what it is, <clears throat> but there are also people that are lower, maybe 25, 26, 27, 28 BMIs that are quote unquote overweight, but not into class one obesity that want to lose quote unquote a few pounds, and they're still overweight. <clears throat> and if done safely, I, I don't have a problem with that. Um, personally. But what I have found is that a lot of those people don't always have massive metabolic derangement. But more often than I think I would, I see near pre-diabetics, pre-diabetes, elevated glucoses, uh, maybe some low-grade fatty liver, <clears throat> um, elevated enzymes, or maybe a singular triglyceride level that's out of whack. Or you know what I'm saying? So what I have come to think about lately is that to me it seems that glucose homeostasis disruption is seemingly a bigger problem than really cholesterol dysregulation and the things that come with glucose homeostasis the diabetes the obesity the the diabetes right we've talked about this on this podcast too and it seems to be more important if you had to you know, obviously you want to focus on all of it, but if I had to give one greater importance to the other, what do you think? Do you think that getting people healthier from a glucose standpoint and the way GLPs work could have a greater, more profound impact on their, the atherogenicity of their, what's floating around their blood, their cardiovascular disease, or do you think it's just true, true and related, but, but we didn't need to address both things simultaneously, or do you think one's kind of gaining ground on the other in terms of importance? I think for me, the the insulin diabetic dysregulation plays as much, if not more, of a role. And I think it depends on the person. So oh, for, sure. for, for certain individuals, and Chester, who's joined us here, can speak to this. He was actually my first patient that I uh, actually prescribed a, a, a PS, uh, PCS um, K9 inhibitor to. And for him wait, that wait, wait real quick i just want to stop just so i can couch this in what you just said because i think it's it'd be interesting J just so we know when when you move forward with this he probably had a problem with his cholesterol but did he have was his a1c okay was that's what i was going to say because he, oh, when sorry. he came to me yeah that's where i was going is he came to me and 
was quite, uh, um, I, I don't know how to say when I first saw him, like quite athletic looking, didn't have fit. a problem with it. fit. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> didn't have a works out all the time. Didn't have uh, an issue with diet, knew the diet, knew all this stuff um, for diabetes markers were all great. But yet we had a cholesterol issue that had to be dealt uh, with. So okay. I don't think that those are always the case. Like a lot of times those patients travel in packs, right? I'm obese, I have lipid dysregulation, and I have diabetes. But for someone who maybe that doesn't hold true, and for that patient that I just described, I like the GLP ones for a lot, and I'm starting to lean into those maybe as more of a long term as opposed to just for, for weight loss reduction for the short term. But for someone like Chester, and I hope he's all right with me talking about his health on the air, I didn't uh, ask him about that, but came to me and um, who's diabetic yeah, profile. Do we have HIPAA, we have HIPAA uh, <laughs> uh, compliance here. Do you, give, a, do you give permission, Chester? Yeah, yeah. Just don't tell the calcium score. Cause I'm <laughs> I, won't, I won't give any details, but I'll just say his his cholesterol was a greater specific issue for the for him in cardiovascular reduction than was his diabetic predilection. Okay, that's a you good know. point. And so what we chose, and then we went down the stat and we ran into those issues that are you're likely to run into, right? Specifically, if I remember correctly, it was the liver enzymes that became a big problem for him. I don't think it was so much the muscle, but we saw a significant, and I think we tried two, not three, I think we tried two different statins. Uh, and then eventually we went to Repatha. Is that, is that, did I recall that correctly? Yeah. Chester? Um, we were on different doses of resuvastatin, and I did not mm. tolerate them. And in general, athletes can have issues with statins because statins can cause muscle damage sort of independently. And then what happens is if you're an athlete, you're in the gym training, and that also causes muscle damage. Mm. So you have sort of this combination effect of muscle damage from the gym, potential uh, myopathies, uh, myalgia, muscle damage um, from the statins. What that can do is sort of cause a cascade of creatine kinase release, which is an yep. enzyme stored inside of your muscles. And there's a sort of a linear relationship between the amount of creatine kinase in your blood and your liver enzyme. So if you got a little bit of muscle damage, and creatine kinase is not certainly the, the best indicator uh, of muscle damage by any means, but it can happen as a result of um, the statin use, combination with the exercise. So that gets into your blood, increases your liver enzymes. So you might see some exacerbated liver enzymes in athletes running statins. And that's what we ran into with my particular situation. So we had to turn to the PCSK9 inhibitor known as Repatha. And it's interesting. I was your first ever patient to use Repatha. I remember doing that injection in your office. <laughs> We were kind of figuring it was like four years ago. I mean, this thing was a relatively new medication. We we're kind of reading through the instructions. It came with a brochure that's like, you know, the size of a treasure map. You know, it was just absolutely giant, like four feet by five feet of instructions, a um, whole bunch of pictures and stuff. I guess they assume you're blind. You can't really look at a smaller uh, manual uh, or pamphlet, if you will. But essentially, yeah, we, we did those uh Repatha injection for the first time in your office, and it completely changed the trajectory of my uh, cholesterol. And ever since, the, the PCSK9 inhibitors, Repatha is not the only one, they have gained so much popularity and so much intrigue. And I feel like it's because you can minimize uh, the potential liver enzyme effects, the negative effects in your muscle, and they do work essentially as well, if not better, as the statins without the side effects. The only downside is you, you do have to inject, and some people are Yeah, but like, would you call that a downside? Like, I think for you, for I me, know, I, I almost look at it as a positive. It's once every month or once every two-week dose. It seems like, yeah, I mean, it's an injection, but it, it was a pretty cool little device, a little auto-injector. Um, and it was just once a month, and you were done, or once every two weeks, depending on the dose, and, and you were done, which seems kind of nice to me. What, what what say you as an actual patient taking it? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a simple subcutaneous injection. Um, you barely even feel it. I'm typically on my phone or reading, and I just kind of put it on my thigh and hit the inject button. One time I did do it, and I was like super, super shredded. Um, I'm talking about like to the point of like glute veins, so not a lot of people get this level of shredded. But I had <laughs> glute zero veins? Stuff. Glute veins. That's a different uh, level of shredded. I've never had a glute vein. <laughs> I was in like survival mode. Where you're working on like four to five hours of sleep and all your endocrinology is messed up um, because you're just – you're so shredded. Everything, you're in your, your, your bare necessity to survive in terms of uh, body fat. But I did a, a three – the repath I was using was a three cc, a three milliliter – injection subcutaneous in my thigh and i just had like this wealth of um fluid underneath my thigh and you could just see it so 
apparent. And that's kind of the only downside side effect that I've had um, was when you're super, super lean. If you ever get this lean, the injection looks pretty gnarly. But besides that, I mean, it is. I'm well pretty sure I'll never have that problem. Yeah. And when I'm chunky, <laughs> I don't see it. But, but it is. Yeah, it, well, it, it was pretty cool. Yeah. And it's, it was really effective, I think, um, as well, which we, you know, it was like, oh, wow, this is kind of cool. And we actually brought in a cardiologist consult on that um, mm-hmm. because it was a, a new script for me. And we kind of covered some things. I was like, ah, let's get the cardiologist's opinion. And we needed that, turns out, for that damn insurance prior authorization, which was hell to go through. Yeah, that was. I was really concerned you were going to drop me as a patient um, because it was <laughs> so incredibly difficult to get that through. It depends went, if you ask me or my staff what, yeah. where, where you fell on that answer. <laughs> yeah. Jason and I are going through kind of the some some of the similar things because we're trying to get the uh, Vasipa, we're trying approved, to get Vasipa, which is a yeah. prescription fish oil, which is another one you can do, um, sort of a combination therapy. But Repatha is incredibly effective, minimal. So these are these PCKS nine. You're in you're in they're auto they're monoclonal antibodies to the to the enzyme to the p uh pcks9 ps pcsk9 enzyme and inhibiting it with this monoclonal antibody means there are more ldl receptors they get recycled and destroyed less there's more of them around and then thus they clear the bloodstream of ldl more effectively because there's just more receptors around for the it's a pretty cool right? concept yeah 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 so essentially statins they can lower your ldl by about 30 to 50 percent potentially more if you sort of mega dose the statin your pcsk9 inhibitors they've shown about 45 to 70 percent reduction in ldl so an even greater sort of the high end of you know a moderate dose statin is like the low end of effectivity of these pcsk9 inhibitors and then even if you're mega dosing statins which you're probably going to get a whole bunch of side effects yeah don't mega dose statins yeah, they're, they're not even as effective as these PCSK9 inhibitors. And, and to be honest, you know, I rather inject something for four minutes, like a four minute, five minute shot, inject something once a month and have to do pills every single day uh, for me personally. So I, I do look at that as sort of a positive. Some people don't like the injection, but I think it's, it's super convenient. But it's not an injection like you're filling a syringe and doing an IM injection, right? It was a pretty cool little auto injector that had some adhesive on the back and you just placed it yeah, it's just for the injection. Big. There's a little vial, you kind of clean it off, place it in the injector, um, peel it back, and then stick a, stick it on your body, and then you just hit the button. And it's, you know, color-coded. It blinks, you know, green and blue, essentially, when it's going and when it's done. It makes little cool noises, tells you when it's done. <laughs> you just kind of do your thing. And obviously, you don't touch the site of injection. Uh, you may want to, especially if you're super low body fat because it looks kind of gnarly. Um, but besides that, I think it's going to be the new agent and data is confirming, not just on the reduction of LDL, it's got a little effect on lipoprotein A as well, which can be beneficial to reduce that, to reduce atherosclerotic risk. But you're seeing it in the data in terms of the reduction of heart attacks and stroke. There was a 25% reduction in heart attacks in, in one of these studies and then a 19% reduction in stroke. So you're seeing the actual cholesterol data manifest itself, uh, into some positive outcomes. Um, yeah, and so, I since then I've had more patients and pretty good success, specifically in the ApoB reduction world. It seems to be really uh, effective in that regard, and using that as a measurement as well. Yeah, you Absolutely. tend to see about a forty to fifty percent reduction in ApoB, so incredibly effective with that marker as well. Cool. Yeah, so and so the so lower the, side effect the, profile as well. The, I might add. The stepwise fashion would be statins. S. I don't know how to pronounce the um and then is that a meme? Is that a meme? Yeah, sorry. And then and then the PSK nine inhibitors after that. If you don't get the adequate reduction you need. Yeah, what sucks is in order to get a insurance approval from the PCSK9, and you definitely want some insurance to cover this because it's like 500 bucks a month, whereas you know mm. stats are much cheaper and much more likely to get approved. The downside to get your approval for PCSK9s is you have to demonstrate like an ineffectivity to statins. You have mm-hmm. to demonstrate like a really high CT score, or you have to demonstrate familial history of a coronary event. And I'm in sort of this unique bucket where my grandfather had his first heart attack at 38. So I said, oh, wow, had, I don't remember that. Wow. Yeah, and I was intolerant to statins. So that's why I got kind of a double whammy. Uh, and that's maybe why my cholesterol was elevated. You know, my parents have been on cholesterol medic- medication since their thirties. And that was back when, wow, you know, really? Their diet was good. Their exercise were good. They were incredibly lean. They were fit. 
um, just genetically. Hence that family history we talked about. Yeah, the opposite of the lottery is I hit that in terms of <laughs> you know, cholesterol. Apples, you didn't get the hundred like I have. Yeah, yeah, I got the. Yeah. <laughs> I'd never measured my ApoB. I wonder. I do. I have to throw it in. I don't have much. He's talking about glute veins. He was so lean. My God, I got to take something here. I wonder what my ApoB is. Um, it has to be. It has to be low. And you know, I mean, my LDL is low. My triglycerides are low. My total cholesterol is low. I would. Yeah, I would be. encourage everyone to get their lipids, especially you know their, their LDL. Your ApoB, and especially your LPA, because your LPA, even if you do lifestyle interventions, that's going to be the genetic element that it's going to be very difficult to change. So just knowing that and how you can live your life. And, it, you know, we talked about earlier on a previous podcast, like, are the vegetables worth it? I always think they are. But certainly if you have like an elevated LP little a, doing those little details of lifestyle modifications, eating clean, getting your steps in. Those are going to pay dividends because, again, LPA is something you just really can't modify yet. We have the new drug, Pelicarsin. Yeah, what's that new drug we were talking about? What was the name again? Yeah, Pelicarsin. Pelicarsin is a stage three clinical trial right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the data are looking absolutely incredible in terms of what it can do to your LPA. Now, we're going to see if that manifests itself into, okay, does this reduce heart attack? Does this reduce stroke? But in terms of the raw biomarkers, it is moving the needle more than anything ever has, the pelicarsin. And then it should be wrapped up maybe, I don't know, 2025, 2026. I don't know, 100 percent sure. But essentially, they're done with the recruiting for the phase three trial. And now we're just kind of look, waiting, waiting for the data and then the data analysis. Yeah, that'll be the crux. Does it actually result in, in reductions in whatever yeah, their like measurements are? niacin earlier niacin is good for the hdl but we weren't seeing the data in terms of um does it is it actually reducing risk in terms of niacin it was so incredibly mixed niacin. so in my opinion with the flushing i wouldn't opt for the niacin route and also we know um hdl function is just as important if not more important than hdl number uh, in terms of your disease risk theoretical theoretical question for you guys and and obviously has no correct answer when I say it, but say, you know, Chester talked about Rapatha getting through insurance and you have to have the specific, that's what insurance does, right? Did you fail a stat and do you have a, a CT score of this? Do you have this? And if you don't meet those, but you have a high ApoB and you want to uh, use something like Rapatha, I, I have a patient who has chosen that answer to be yes. His cost was about 500 bucks and that's a month. So I, I, I got to imagine for the majority of people, that's a cost prohibitive, but if it wasn't, you know, would you still then choose to use it? Even if it's not cost prohibitive, is that something that you're willing to spend money on to, to, to lower your APOB risk? And what do you guys think? For me, if I couldn't do it. If I couldn't do it in, in other ways, diet, exercise, nutrition, et cetera, than, than I was, I'm, but I'm not in the same boat genetically as Chester. Yeah, and also whatever drug you take, obviously try to do you know, a good RX or sometimes Repatha has like a little prepaid card type thing. Definitely explore those. We're trying to do, Jason and I are trying to do another one of those with Vasipa, which is the first FDA approved fish oil. So fish oil has different components. EPA is the essential component that's going to help you reduce your cardiovascular risk. And Vasipa is 99.99%. Uh, EPA. So it's essentially the, the best portion of the fish oil. The DHA is important, but the EPA is really going to give you the most bang for your buck in terms of reducing your cardiovascular risk, your anti-inflammatory properties, improving your endothelial function. So that is going to be the bread and butter. And Vasipa is kind of uh, a pill that you can take as a prescription fish oil, basically. And it's going to give you a lot of good bang for your buck, especially in terms of reducing triglycerides, um, as well as some some markers of LDL and such. What's that cost uh, cash if you can't get it through Dino? Have you priced oh, it out? They have a good RX, and the good RX was like eighty dollars a month. Okay, so we're not as high as a Rapatha, and obviously that makes sense. I mean, based on exactly compound. the hoops that we had to jump through trying to get myself Rapatha, Jason and I are jumping through those same hoops to try to get Vasipa approved for me. God bless you, Jason. Yeah, I'd like I to see uh, a high quality fish oil like Nordic Naturals or something go head to head with the SEPA. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure. I mean, I get the idea that you want to get the the EPA and it's high quality, but uh, you know, looking at cost, uh, I don't know. I, w I wonder. Well, I wonder can... what that cost is for uh, a, a good quality OTC uh, EPA. It's probably at least forty or fifty bucks. 
a month, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. I would, and obviously the issue you have with the supplements is um, you have no guarantee that the ingredient in the actual package matches the label. Correct. Well, they, Say it's you know X amount of EPA, but well, is- nor do you in drugs as well, uh, to some degree. And uh, now in a brand name, it should be, but but even like it was a generic. Uh, one of the classic things is levothyroxine, but a generic. I can't remember what the figure is, but it only has to have X amount of actual drug in it, which is bizarre to me. That's insane that you. Can- oh, I didn't know that. Oh my Maybe gosh! Yes. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So I don't. So you. That's a venue. Whole- you have to diet and exercise. <laughs> yeah, it's always that's always an issue. Is is it to have what it says in there? But anyways, yeah. But Vasipa is another one with very low side effects. So if you're looking for something besides a statin and you want a good one two, uh, your Repatha or your PCSK9 mm-hmm. inhibitor, whichever one you choose, um, Repatha is probably the most popular one, uh, at least the one that I've heard of the most. And then your Vasipa as well. There's also other things like uh, Azetamide. That can be incredible in terms of helping limit your uh, intake of cholesterol and then your benfendoic acid, which is going to be an inhibitor of cholesterol synthesis, similar to the statin, but it's going to work on a little bit different uh, of a mechanism. Um, but those are two other great ones to discuss with, you know, your physician, your healthcare team or Vitality Telehealth, uh, your Izenamibe and your benfendoic acid. And I'm about to get blood work. I'm probably myself pending my uh, LDL and my FOB maybe could consider starting benfendoic acid but, but, uh, based on how I respond to the azetamide or patha combination. Yeah, it'd be cool to see how those turn out. And I think it's I think it's good information for patients to know the alternatives to statins. And also, I think one of the basic things I tell patients sometimes is try different statins in different yeah. doses. They have right? different half-lives. Yeah, it's going to be tremendously important. Yep, I agree. Well, cool. That's good to hear some alternatives, though, because I, uh, I think, I don't think we're all big fans of, or none of us are big fans of statins in general. So it's nice to hear that there are some other uh, alternatives that are kind of making some headway and showing some effectiveness uh, on the Absolutely. market today. But of course, there is always the old tried and true uh, lifestyle, and I think that's where we head next. We'll talk about some lifestyle stuff and diet stuff and exercise that can also be effective management tools. Um, without using prescription drugs at all. Agreed. Let's do it. Next episode. See you guys on the flip side. Yeah. Next episode. (laughs) All right. Sounds great, guys. See you, man. See you.